How about now? Can you hear me now? You can hear me? Maybe? Yes, no? Yes, no? <laughs> This is so terrible. Okay, good. Thank God. So crazy. Technology is wonderful when it works. Um, okay, so I have a lot of stuff to tell you today. Mainly, I'm going to be answering a lot of questions. So if you have questions today, great. If not, uh, no problem. No problem. I have. Um, I asked on Facebook and Instagram over the last week and a half to give me some questions, some questions that people generally have. And so... Um, I have a few questions. There's no order. I'm just going to kind of go through them um, and we'll see what happens, I guess. Um, by the way, I bought this yesterday for this morning. Zoro, Zorus Energy Drink Plus. Um, it is from, oh no, with honey. I love honey, but artificial honey is usually terrible. It's from Thailand, I think, I thought. Uh, yeah, manufactured in Thailand. So it's an energy drink. You have to like rip open the top. No idea what this tastes like. But, oh dang, a lot of pressure. We shall try. I bought a product from Thailand a couple of days ago and tried it. It was tea. It was terrible tea. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. That tastes almost identical to um Filipino <laughs> kids we'll see. Uh Red Bull tastes very ident almost identical to Red Bull. I would not know the difference. That is good. <laughs> Filipino kids miss you. That's funny. Yeah, I miss them. They were fun. They always have this excitement. I don't know. No matter where you walk, they run up to you and they're like excited. But it's the same thing in India, I guess. Uh, not so much in the south, in the north, in the north India. Generally, they just like come up to you and they're big, bright smiles. They're so excited to talk to you. I don't know. It's fun. Anyway, so I have a lot of questions I'm going to go through. I'm going to get a lot of these questions out of the way. Um, and then I have a couple more, I don't know, current things to tell you about everything that's happening now. Um, so let's just go through these. I, there's no order. Number one, um, what are all the sources of your income while traveling? Um, it's better if you say a monetary value. No, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, um, what are all the sources? Basically, I have no income, uh, almost none. I mean, none. There's YouTube, but because of the whole virus thing, the uh, uh, income went from here to here. I'm not joking. Like it, it dropped like six. 600%, like, or 700%, it just, like, died. Everything about my channel died because I was talking about China during the pandemic. And number one, advertising kind of disappeared during that time because nobody's advertising, because nobody can go out to buy anything. Uh, and number two, I think the bigger reason is because I was talking about China, uh, YouTube censors everything bad about China. Even someone said that it, it's still going on. Uh, they won't publicly admit it, but I can see it's happening. And when you look at other people on YouTube, they're all saying it's happening. There's huge algorithm changes in regards to China. Just yesterday, someone commented, just something, something, China. Where did it go? It ended up in my spam folder. Spam, automatically, because he said the word China. Uh, so it's, it's insane. So my channel basically died. But generally... Um, that's my income, uh, YouTube, which is not very much. Uh, I don't really have income while I travel. Basically, uh, I just rely on my savings. Savings is, oops, savings is uh, everything. So, and monet giving you the monetary value? No, um, but just savings. Is solo travel lonely? Um, I wrote a post about this. In fact, you can go check out my response uh, to the new website, which I'm going to talk to you, talk about this to you at the end of the video, um, solotravel365.com slash lonely. Yeah, solotravel365.com slash lonely. If you go there, you will actually see a huge response 
um, a lot of information in regards to that topic, but generally, yes and no. It can be lonely. It depends on your personality and it depends on how you travel. For me, it is very rare that I feel lonely. I can say that I would say right now during this whole quarantine thing, yeah. Um, generally, when I'm traveling and I'm not on a lockdown, uh, no, uh, my personality is to go out and meet people and have fun with people. Oh, great, the power's out, like always. I'm going to start sweating profusely because it's like an oven in my room. Um, this is going to be terrible. And my battery won't last very long, so even worse. <laughs> I have to cut it short today. So generally when I'm out traveling, uh, I meet people. And so everywhere I go, people either A, come up to me and talk to me, which then I'm not lonely, or B, they invite me to their home, they invite me out to dinner, they invite me to go hang out, they invite me to travel together. Um, and so I'm not lonely. Um, basically, almost every single day that I go outside, I can either A, meet new people, or B, meet someone that I met before who wants to hang out. So I'm almost never lonely. Um, the only time I would become lonely is if I try to meet people and it fails. People don't invite me anywhere. People don't want to hang out. Then, yeah, I'd be like, well, this is kind of lonely. But um, there are people who have personalities who who don't really care to hang out with people. They're not traveling to hang out with them. They don't care about the culture. They're traveling to see the mountain. They're traveling to see the beautiful buildings. They're traveling to see the theme parks. Yeah, so they don't even care if they speak to a local person. So to them, they never get lonely because they don't care. But generally, I try to speak with local people and hang out with local people. That's the whole point of my big journey. Um, so um, do I feel lonely? No, because generally people want to hang out. And so that makes my life easy. Um, but I encourage you to read that post, solotravel365.com slash lonely, and you'll get a huge response about that. Um, what is one misconception about traveling alone? Ah, I would say that's loneliness. I think a lot of people do believe that solo traveling is lonely. And again, it depends on factors, but generally, no. If you don't want it to be lonely, it won't. If you want it to be lonely, it will. But that wouldn't necessarily mean it's lonely. It's just you don't want to be around people. Um, so that is a big misconception. Um, what else? Maybe I would say that's the big one, loneliness. Uh, when you browse the internet about this topic, everyone seems to be asking that question. Um, Mr. Karen Phyllis, I don't know what that means. Um, I'm going to read your comments really quick before I go back in. 100% believe you. How long have you been traveling for? I have been on the road. Actually, this month, June, I just had my four-year anniversary. So I've been on the road for more than four years. I made just one pit stop back in the United States for a brief time um, before I hopped on the road again. I went to a wedding. I visited a wedding. Uh, but now I'm back on the road. So basically, a short, short window in the United States, but I've been on the road for four years. And I think, I keep hitting the microphone, sorry. Uh, I think I've been uh, to 23 or 24 different countries. I, I don't know because there are, there's different definitions of countries. Like if I say, what is a country? Um, the definition can be different depending on who you talk to. So some people say this is a country. Some people say, no, it's not a country. For example, Puerto Rico, what is that? Mm, that's a good one, um, Puerto Rico. So yeah, it gets weird. Uh, another one is Taiwan. Is Taiwan a country? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, let me see, Pigeon, your first country was the Philippines. Oh, my first country was, yeah, the first time I ever left the United States, I went to South Africa. Um, but that's this four year window. It did not include South Africa. It did not include Africa, I think. No. Um, how do you make money on the road besides YouTube? <laughs> Everything's about money. Um, how do you make money on the... I don't. <laughs> yeah? No. Basically, it's savings and YouTube. And if you buy a T-shirt, I think I make $5, something like that. Um, or a hat. Buy a hat. Um, I have a hat. I ordered a hat right before the, the, the pandemic hit. And then the, the tracking showed that the hat... Ooh, I have power. The tracking showed that the hat made it to the airport. And it's basically like 
basically like in the airport parking lot or building somewhere, warehouse. And before it got on the plane, all the flights were canceled. So my hat is next to a plane somewhere in the United States. And when they turn on the flights, I guess, then my hat will come and then I'll have an edges of earth hat. So you need to buy one, get one. Um, have you ever been to Nilgiri? I thought this was a typo, so I had to Google it. I thought it was Nigeria, but no, it's a, actually a mountain, mountainous area in Tamil Nadu, the state that I'm in right now. I have not been there. Uh, looks cool though. Which country was the easiest place for you to get around with the least amount of problems? The United States. <laughs> no joke. The United States, that was the easiest. Uh, as a tourist, it'd be difficult um, because you have to rent a vehicle and then drive. And if you don't have an international driver's license, it's going to be difficult. So for me, just the United States because I'm from there. But you have to have a car. If you don't have your own personal vehicle in the United States, it would be extremely difficult, like almost impossible to get around um, unless you had a lot of money because public transportation, whatever, uh, it's not super cheap, but it's super inconvenient because we don't have a lot of it. And B, um, um, they don't go everywhere. So let's say you the bus stops here, but you want to go to the zoo, then you have to take a taxi. So you have to hire taxis, and taxis generally are not cheap. So um, that's there at that. So United States, if you have your own personal vehicle, easiest. But outside of the United States, uh, um, they are all really difficult, in my opinion. Uh, basically, they're just, for example, India. I, I can get around all over India, and I think India right now is the easiest for me because I understand it the most. But to someone who is coming to India for the first time, um, it would be just mind-bogglingly difficult. Yeah, And it sometimes is crazy for me. Basically, the trains are easy. Get on the train, go here, done. But when you get off the train and you want to go to somewhere else, hire a taxi, you could think, right? So, um, or, or get on a bus that will take you from this general area to this general area. But the problem is nothing is labeled. So if you, you want to go from here to there, someone says there's a bus that will take you there, but you don't know where to go stand for the bus. There's no bus signs. It's like the man will say, oh, no, no, do you, do you see that, that tree over there next to the red, the red building, the tree in the red building? Yeah, go stand next to the tree in the red building, and that's where the bus will come. How do you know this? But, I, okay, I don't want to go from this area to this area. I want to go from this area to there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to go from here to that area, then you need to go over next to the green building. Next to, do you see that dog over there? Stand next to the dog, and then the bus will come. Like, how do you know this? You don't know unless you know. So, as a tourist, it's really difficult in some of these places. So, but, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about transportation. It's really complicated sometimes. Um, without power, <laughs> you are a, a power, I don't know, power trans. Uh, hello, still remember you? No, I don't. Uh, will you go back to the Philippines? Um, I remember you wrote a comment a couple of days ago and said, do you remember me? But no. There's a lot of people who have commented on my channel who have the name Gamer or something. So I don't know who you are. Did I meet you? I have no idea. Um, maybe. <laughs> POW camp. Oh, uh, I thought you were in a prison of war camp. Nope, definitely not in one of those. Uh, if you had to pick one country to live in for the rest of your life, and what city and town? Um, I don't know the city and town. Even picking the country would be difficult. Um, India's big. India's cool. I like India. I think the top three right now out of, I can only t talk about 23, 24 countries. I think the top three are between the Philippines, India, and Vietnam. Um, I think number four would be Bangladesh. I don't know a lot about Bangladesh. I was only there for a short window. I'd like to go back. Maybe that would be on the higher part of my list. I don't know. But for right now, India, it's big. I can speak to the people in the north, generally, a little bit. Um, so it's interesting to me to be able to communicate through the local language enough to get by. That's fun. The Philippines was awesome. I, I, I only spent 47 days there. I really, really want to go back and understand more and travel deeper than I did before. I traveled a little bit cautiously the first time. That was kind of my, my first experience solo traveling. So I would love to go back to the Philippines. And I think that that would be 
right near the top of my favorite places. I really love the Philippines. The only downside is you can only stay in the Philippines for a month and then you have to exit. Um, or you can get a, a longer visa, but it's ridiculously expensive. So ah, I couldn't uh, stay there for too long. The amount of money that I pay for India for a 10 year visa is equivalent to what I would need to pay if I stayed for three months total in the Philippines. And that includes the first month being free. So one month free and then paying for two months is equivalent to what I would pay, what I would need to pay for two months in the Philippines for 10 years in India. That's how expensive it is. Um, so I, but assuming everything was free and assuming I'm, I'm choosing based on culture, still I would, one of those three countries would be at the top of my list. Um, I'm the one who commented on your Philippines video when you took the wrong bus and arrived in Nasagu, uh, Batangas. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that video. I don't remember your comment. I have like, I have probably close to eight or 10,000 comments on my, on my channel. I, I don't know. And I've responded to almost all of them or read almost all of them. Um, hello from Da Nang. Never been to Da Nang. I want to go. Um, hey man, I'm late. Where are you currently at? And I'm currently in Tamil Nadu, India. Tamil Nadu, India. Um, have you ever been the only Caucasian guy on the airplane? Uh, for those of you who are not native speakers, Caucasian just means white. Have you ever been the only white guy on the airplane? No. Um, I doubt it. I don't know. I've never looked. I guess you just go and sit down. I don't pay attention to the color. <laughs> Of other people. I doubt it. I think that's just too rare. I think that's just too rare. Um, what are the three most enjoyable travel experiences you've ever had? Oh, I think that's going to be one of the most difficult questions to answer and I honestly don't think that I have an answer for you. I would say that all of my favorite, favorite, all of my favorite travel experiences definitely involve meeting local people. Sometimes it's simple. People come up to me and start talking to me on the street, and that conversation turns into an eight-hour conversation. I'm not joking. Sometimes people invite me to their house simply to have tea, simply to have lunch. Some people go out to lunch with me. Some people invite me to hang out with their friends and family the next day. Some people invite me to parties. <laughs> like... Which one is my favorite? Uh, I cannot even, I can't, I can't pick one. They're all awesome in their own way. There's never been one moment that was better than anything else. They're all cool in their own way. If, for example, if someone, if I'm walking in the Philippines and someone invites me to hang out at their house for lunch, and then if I'm walking in India and someone invites me to hang out and come to their house for lunch. The same thing, which one is better? I don't know. The culture is totally different. The house is totally different. The food is totally different. Their personality is totally different. But which one is better? I don't know how to say because they're both interesting in their own way. And I'm thankful to have had both experiences within both societies. So I don't know. I can't pick one. Sorry. Um, the, everything. So like if I could compare hanging out with local people, meeting local people, compared to like visiting a popular mountain or visiting a beach or visiting a building or something like that, totally, people win. 100% all of my most enjoyable travel experiences have come from meeting people, period, bar none. So, yeah. Um, how can you travel when there's a travel ban? You can't. <laughs> I'm not traveling. I've been in this room since January 2nd. January 2nd, like the furthest I've gone by foot is eight minutes walking that way. No, other, I have not been further than an eight minute walk from this room um, and that's every couple of days to go buy food, that's it. One man brought me to the beach um, a couple of, maybe a week, two ago um, and we got there and they said, nope, sorry, the lockdown still exists so you cannot go to the beach. Even though the beach was empty, nobody was there and you can go outside and go to the grocery store and be around 80 different people and breathe on each other, that's okay, but you cannot go to the totally empty beach and sit. <laughs> what? It's so stupid. 
it's like people who make these rules, it's like they're in their own little bubble and they don't think about things before they make these decisions. It's so weird. Um, how do I can, oh, I was gonna go here. Um, how can you say in Vietnamese? It's always amazing to see non-Vietnamese persons. How, oh, what can you say in Vietnamese? Uh, so it's been two years since I have spoken Vietnamese. Um, so I have forgotten more than 50%. And I probably forgot the tones. Um, the picture has been chosen in MUA. Yes, 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 very good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the picture on this video was when I was at an English center in Vietnam in a small rural village in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Um, so how do I speak in, oh my God. I remember people would point, I would ride a bicycle and people would point to me and, or, or they would whisper to each other or shout sometimes. They'd say, gao, gao, rak gao. Like, like they point to a tall person. They're, they're just saying tall, tall, tall. Like to identify that there's a tall person here. Or they would say, um, they'd say, oh may, oh may, something like that, which would say like, oh, he's an American, 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 even though they have no idea I could be from France. But I think just because I'm a white guy, they just automatically assume I'm American, no idea. Um, but they were right, I am. <laughs> uh, but ugh, sentences, I, I, I just remember key words. So forming sentences was never something that I could do because I, I don't understand your grammar very well. Um, but like um, book, if I had a book, I could say sak which would be like my book. Um, things like doi um, uh, means I or me, doi. Uh, you is bang. Um, what else? House is nya. Uh, I don't know. Oh my god, I'd have to. I, I would spend so much time doing this. I don't want to. <laughs> but there are words that I remember, uh, and I got to the point where I, at the end of my fourteen, I think fourteen month journey, I was able to speak to a man for ten minutes who could not speak English. Um, he came up to me, and he started to speak Spanish and Vietnamese. That's he, those are the only two languages that he knew, and I could speak for ten or twelve minutes to him, uh, and I learned every so much about him. He learned a lot about me because I could speak a little Spanish and a little Vietnamese. And so sometimes we would make a Spanish Vietnamese sentence. Like he would say, I, I he told me that he worked, he was part of the military um, and he moved to Cuba for two years and that's where he learned Spanish. He, I learned this based on those Spanish words that he was saying and the Vietnamese words that he was saying. Sometimes he would say a word, say a sentence in Vietnamese and then I would say, this word, this word in Vietnamese, I don't know. He'd say, ah, okay. So he would take that out and put a Spanish word in, in that. And then I would say, ah, okay. So then he would like repeat the sentence using Vietnamese, Vietnamese, Spanish, and then continue in Vietnamese, even though the grammar would probably be crazy, but I completely understood him. And so that's how we communicated. And that's how I communicated to him. I would speak a sentence, but then I didn't know the word in Vietnamese. So I'd speak it in Spanish. Or sometimes I would speak Spanish, but didn't know the word in Spanish. So then I'd put the Vietnamese word in there. It was the weirdest thing, but that's how we communicated. It was, the, it was so fun. Um, but I have since forgotten a lot of Vietnamese. Um, yeah. Um, I am new to the channel. When can you move around again? What will be, the, what will be vlogging about? So I don't know when I'm going to be vlogging again. I, my next country will be Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka, and that's when it'll all start again. Um, so in the meantime, I'm, I'm building the content on my website, which I'll tell you about soon. But I will go to Sri Lanka. Uh, I just learned yesterday that they are thinking about opening up flights in the middle of July next month. So maybe less than one month, it will open again. Uh, and then I can fly, but that's not guaranteed. If you look at the numbers, the statistics on the infections here in India, just five days ago, five days ago, they, I mean, you can look at the graph and it gets worse and worse every single day. There's no stopping. And uh, more 15,500 new infections in one day, new infections in one day, 15,500. And that was five days ago. So probably it's maybe now up to, uh, 18 or 20,000 
per day, new infections. So with these kind of numbers, I kind of feel that it's going to be rare or not very likely that they open up next month. So I don't know. Um, how do I convince my parents to let me travel solo or even with my friends? And then they show the sad face. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so by you asking me this question, I have no idea. I have no idea if you're a man or a woman and I don't know what country you are from. But my guess is that you're a woman by asking this question. And also my guess is that you are not from a Western country. The reason I say this is because there's such a huge difference between Western culture and Asian culture. So my guess is you are from Asia somewhere. Um, that's my guess, maybe I'm wrong. But <clears throat> because generally in Asian cultures, the parents, the elders, I should say, the grandparents, the parents, and then the children, the, the, the parents have complete control or massive influence on their children's decisions in life. And so above that is actually their grandparents. They have the, the highest ranking authority within the household. <clears throat> so whatever your parents or grandparents tell you that you should do, you need to do it without question. If you want to be a doctor, but they say, no, we want you to be a janitor, then you need to be a janitor, really. So the culture is very different. From a Western perspective, generally, your parents support you. It is the children's decision in life. It is, we are independent. So whatever I want to do, I will do. And generally, the parents support their decision. Unless the parents really think that that's a terrible thing, don't do it, it's a bad decision, then we won't tell you that you can't do it, but they will tell you that, yeah, this is probably not a good idea because, and then they'll give you reasons, and then they hope that you change your mind, but they won't force you. But cultures are different, so that's why my guess is that you are from Asia. That's my guess. So generally, how do you convince your parents? I don't know, that you are in a completely different culture and I cannot understand this. I don't know why people can't live an independent life and make their own choices without influence of their, without such a huge influence from their parents. I don't know, maybe to Asian culture, they don't like Western culture because we're different. And if we, if you speak to Westerners and they look at this culture, they'd say, oh, that's terrible. So both would look at each other's culture and think, the other culture is weird, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question other than show them countless stories of Western travelers who are doing it. Question them, ask them why. Say why, why not? Once they provide specific, a specific reason or reasons why not, then you know how to challenge them. Then you know how to convince them. For, for example, say, no, 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 it's just too dangerous. And if that's their main concern, awesome. Now you know how to influence them. Find all kinds of evidence that support that it's not dangerous. Um, and in fact, you can read on my website about that, but I don't have a link for you. Um, you'll have to find it. But anyway, um, yeah, figure out why they don't want you to, and then you can kind of go from there. Um, My God, you still remember so many Vietnamese words. Yeah, I know more. I know a lot more, actually. I just, it's been two years since I spoke. Yeah, like very means rock, like R-A-T, R-A-T, I think, rock. Uh, mop means fat. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's more. Uh, thoughts on George Floyd's situation in the US? Don't, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> No, no thoughts, because it doesn't matter if I say the way that the media has blown everything out of complete proportion, it, proportion, it doesn't matter if I say, oh, it's terrible, or it doesn't matter if I say, I don't support it, doesn't matter what part of the aisle I am on, people will hate me. So 
No, I won't even, I won't even get into that, sorry. Uh, where do you think I am from? Uh, Zedric Gamer, Philippines, because you asked me if I'm going to go to the Philippines, and usually everybody asks me if I will return to their country, so my guess is you're from the Philippines. Um, what I feel is you can't leave India by July, so I would strongly recommend you get married to an Indian girl and start living, totally. I was at the grocery store yesterday, there's one old man, He's, oops, sorry. He's the owner of the grocery store. It's a big grocery store. And he, um, I don't know, he's maybe 60 years old, 65, I have no idea. And, and he was asking me why I'm still here. And I said, yeah, no planes. It keeps canceling and canceling. And I said something like, um, I'll probably be here until next year because it just, this, all these problems. And, and I said, I might as well just get married to uh, an Indian girl in, in Tamil Nadu. He thought that was the funniest thing he has ever heard. He started to laugh so loud. He told the cashiers who were women who were helping me check out at that moment, and they all died of laughter. Everybody like in the checkout aisle just started to laugh and laugh and laugh because I said I might get married to an Indian girl in Tamil Nadu. I don't know, they all thought it was funny. So that was yesterday. Is Vietnam is v, is Vietnam is Vietnam similar to China or Philippines? Interesting question. Um, how do I say this? China and Vietnam are almost identical. Everywhere in Vietnam is extremely similar from my perspective who cannot speak either language, really. Um, very similar. All of Vietnam is generally just like the rural areas, the countryside areas of China. I cannot tell a difference. If I was to walk, watch people, just not listen, because I can hear a diff slight difference in the, in the in the sound of the language. But if I plugged my ears, walked around, um, I would not generally be able to see the differences between Vietnam and China, uh, unless I was next to a river because you have a lot of river houses on stilts. In China, they didn't have a lot of that, um, but they did. Um, so generally, it's the same. The only difference I can notice is when you go to China in the cities, it's like a futuristic Vietnam. It's just like you're in the future. It's the future of Vietnam in the Chinese cities. So from my perspective, there are so many similarities between, between China and Vietnam, really. Um, the Philippines and China, almost nothing in common. <laughs> like almost nothing in common. That's from my perspective. Uh, not just the language, just the personality. People in the Philippines are so full of energy, so full of happiness, so full of... I don't know, uh, they are, what I love about the Philippines so much is the personality of each individual is so outgoing. They almost have no fear, no shyness. Like it doesn't even exist in your culture, very little. People will do anything at any moment without fear of rejection or embarrassment from other people. That is what I love about uh, the Philippines. China, that was not the case. Um, China's, China's culture is very, very different and it felt very similar to Vietnam. So I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. If you went to all three, like I have, you would get the feeling, but I don't know how to describe it, to be honest. Um, what I feel is you can't, oh, I said that already. Uh, as a Canadian, is there a way to travel in Vietnam for a year? Um, yeah. You just have to pay more money. Um, but yes, Americans are so lucky with a one-year visa in Vietnam. When I was in Vietnam, uh, uh there was no one year. I, I someone told me like six months ago that there have been changes to the visa process, the visa in Vietnam. But when I went on their website, I couldn't notice a difference. But when I was there, the longest visa I could get was three months. So every three months, I had to make a visa run, a visa run over and over. 
Um, so there was no one year for me. The only way you could get a one year uh, is if you got a business visa. You had to prove that you were working at a company in Vietnam and then they would give it to you. But it was like 300 US dollars. So it was not cheap at all. Um, something like that, 200, 300. So if there's a one year tourist visa, I don't know anything about it. And I hope that's the case. So if you know more, tell me. Um, yeah, but there are, so Americans are quite fortunate in some areas. I know China, I have a 10 year visa right now in my passport. India, I have a 10 year visa right now in my passport. I think I read last year that Brazil, I can get a 10 year visa in my passport as an American in Brazil. And there's probably a couple other countries where we are particularly fortunate. But on the flip side of that coin, <clears throat> there's many countries that I have looked into and they take advantage of Americans when they come into their country in terms of the visa. Um, for example, <clears throat> when I went to Bangladesh um, or Pakistan, I haven't gone there, but I want to, the number one most expensive visa was the American visa. Everybody else is paying $20, $30, $5, $45, but the American, $165 for one month. $165, that's insanity. Uh, and then, so when you talk about this, local people will say, yeah, yeah, but, but, but look what America does. America charges us $165, so our country just does the same thing back. Well, no, that's, that's, that's stupid, because the cost of doing business in the United States is not cheap. To have people do this paperwork, yeah, it probably costs probably a little bit less than that, but to push paper, do stamps, and, and go through different departments, it's not a cheap thing. But to do that same process in your country does not cost 160. There are people working at that office who do not make $165 per year. So you're telling me every time someone does this, they get paid their their monthly income by one stamp? No. So the reality is, is things are unfair financially. Um, it's just we get charged an American price in an underdeveloped, cheaper country, which isn't fair. But it is fair if they had to pay a local price. It's not about what color your skin is or where you're from. It's about the cost of doing business in this country and the cost of doing business in this country. If it's cheaper to do it here, then it should be a cheaper price. It, it, price. If it's more expensive here, then it should be a more expensive price. That's simple logic, but everything is so stupid in terms of politics. It drives me insane. So I don't know anything about your particular question. Um, USA can get a six month and one year visa in Vietnam. Oh my God, is that a tourist visa or a Business visa. Um, our visa runs legal. Our visa runs legal, or are they forwarded, or are they frowned upon in Vietnam? No, totally legal. I did it three, three times, three, six, four times. I don't know, three or four times. I went to Cambodia and back, Cambodia and back, Cambodia and back. Maybe one more. Totally fine. Yep. Um, so yeah, let me know if it's a tourist visa because I don't know. That's that's cool. Um, what are some of the things you miss back home while you're trap while you're traveling, living outside the U.S.? Oh my God! Um, so really, I don't miss a lot, honestly, because I really love the adventure. The adventure to me is so cool. So I don't miss a lot, but I will say one thing that I find particularly convenient is being able to walk to your faucet, turn on the water, and drink it. To me, that is like heaven. Um, but now I have to go all the way, excuse me, all the way outside, carry this big jug, get it filled, walk it all the way back, bring it, pour it into this bottle, and the water goes all over the place. And then I don't know, it's just like so inconvenient just to drink water. Um, the bathroom, the wet bathroom. So everything in the bathroom can get wet. The toilet, because there's a squat toilet, the walls, the floor, the everything. It's just everything can get wet. And so Let's say you take a shower, you go out, you finish, you're dry, 20 minutes, one hour later, you go back in there because you need to pee, and then the floor is still wet, so now your feet are totally wet, and ooh, you're dry, and then you have to go back into wet water area, and then you have to come back out uh, and then dry your feet, but if your feet don't get dried perfectly, then you leave little spots all over the ground, and it's just like frustrating. So dry bathrooms, I really miss that. Um, yeah, hot water, cold water. 
Uh, many places just rely on the sun for hot, hot water, and it's really damn hot during the day. Like, it'll burn your skin during the day, so you have to be careful. Um, but in the winter, uh -uh. during the sunlight, during the day, it's still really cold water. Um, so there's no hot water here. Um, so little things like that, but nothing... Oops, sorry, I keep hitting the microphone, I forget it's down there. But nothing dramatic, nothing dramatic at all. Um, yeah, tourist visa only, oh my God. If you can, since you're like on the computer now, tell me what the cost of a six month or 12 month tourist visa is for Vietnam. Because that number may influence my travels in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, what country are you in now, and when are you coming to visit Australia? <laughs> if Australia ever lets anyone back in or out again. Also, what is your favorite country? So I'm in India. I'm in Tamil Nadu, India, the very south of India. Um, when am I coming to Australia? Probably never. <laughs> Sorry. I love Asia, and I love traveling to underdeveloped countries. Not because I love seeing underdevelopment, um, but I love seeing how humans live without modern technology. It is the coolest thing in my mind. I don't know why. In, in addition to that, how they live is different from country to country or culture to culture. And it's so much fun to go and look at this. But on the flip side, let's say I went to all of the developed areas. Let's say I went to the big cities in each of those countries it's almost the same. Every place is like the same. Other than language changes, it's all the same. And so that's boring to me. So that's why I visit the underdeveloped areas within the, cult, within the country because it just varies so drastically between this country and this country and this country. And so that's what I love so much about it. It's not that I like to see people living in rough conditions. No, it's not easy to see. But the culture is what I fall in love with, I guess. And you can get more of that authentic culture when you exit the tourist area. Um, where was your, what else was you, oh, what is your favorite country? I think I answered that kind of, where would you want to stay longer? Where would you want to live forever? Well, when I do this with my eyes, it's like a delay. It looked like my eyes were like white, like I was blind. I don't know, maybe weird, anyway. Um, also, what is your favorite country? Yeah, so the country that I said before, probably some, I don't know, it'd be currently mixed between India, Philippines, Vietnam, something like that, and possibly Bangladesh, but I need to spend more time there to understand that, but it's very similar to India. Um, how much do you typically spend? I think that's one of these questions. Um, how is the situation affecting your travels? Oh, it's affecting, all right. I sh as of right now, I should have been I should have already finished my month trip to Sri Lanka and I should have already been in Pakistan for more than a month. None of these things have happened because everything just got destroyed because of this thing. This thing. So it definitely affected my, uh, it definitely affected everything. Uh, where's your next destination after India? Sri Lanka. Um, I'll answer your question in a second. When you... When you watch US TV, what app or website do you use? YouTube. Um, I don't watch TV at all. I don't watch movies, I don't watch TV shows, nothing. The only thing I do is watch YouTube, and it's usually when I eat breakfast in the morning or eat dinner at night, I'll watch like 30 minutes, um, but I, I try and change it to double speed, so I watch, actually watch 30 minutes of YouTube and news and information within 15 minutes of time because I, I just listen quickly. Um, but I don't watch anything. I am, I am the most disconnected American than you know. I know more about what's happening here than I do in my own country. Um, okay, cool, you have the information. $190 USA for one year visa, $160 for six months. Okay, so you totally might as well get the 100. And, um, yeah, so for, interesting. For the six, six month visa in Vietnam, is the exact same price that I paid for a 10-year visa in India. I'm not joking. So these are the price differences. But 200 bucks for one year, that's not bad. I would pay that because, because I paid when I lived, if this is Vietnam, I lived here 
And in order to do a visa run, I needed to go here, but there was no buses that would take me here. So actually I had to take an overnight bus from here to here, uh, and then from here to here, and then do the visa thing and then go back and go back. That process took two days, about a day and a half of travel because of the buses and things, and it's just crazy. About a day and a half to do this whole journey, and out of my wallet was about 100 US dollars every three months from the journey from here to here to here to here to here, plus the visa fees, everything was about $100, about 85 or 100 depending on whatever. So that's like six months equals one year, so it would be cheaper to do that. Um, thank you for that information. That may influence my future travels. Do, so if I return to Vietnam, I would go to the south, the very, very bottom. I want deep, 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 deep culture, the places where not very many people go. It is very underdeveloped down there, like really underdeveloped. Um, I would want to go there. That's what I'd want. Yeah, and I, I would try my best to rent, buy, rent, I don't know, rent a house made out of house on stilts, on sticks, next to the river. That'd be the coolest thing ever. Such an authentic experience to do that. Um, but I doubt many of those, you usually have to build them and own them. Nope, there's not really places to rent there. So I don't know, maybe difficult. But I think that'd be the coolest thing ever. And I'd make a whole YouTube series about it. Um, respond, what is your worst part of being a solo traveler? Um, I actually prepared another link for you. Go to solotravel365.com slash pros cons, P-R-O-S-C-O-N-S, solotravel365.com slash pros cons. Um, and I'll give you a list of all the cool things about solo traveling and all of the bad things about solo traveling. Um, so to answer your question, what is the worst part of being a solo traveler? Two things that frustrate me the most. One, the visa process. I hate it. It is so confusing, so time consuming, and sometimes really expensive. So I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. That is the worst part about solo traveling. But actually, that's the second worst part. The first worst part is, sorry, again. The first worst part is meeting people, awesome people around the world and saying goodbye. That is, there's no worst part about solo traveling. I have met some of the coolest, most friendly, some, some of the most caring, some of the most, uh, hospitable people in so many countries, almost every country, I've met just the coolest, friendliest people. And eventually, and you could connect on a deep level, sometimes just as deep or deeper than some very close friends in the United States. Yeah, deep connections. And then you have to walk away and say goodbye. That sucks. It is not a fun thing to do. I would say that is the worst part about solo traveling. Because this has happened so many times, <clears throat> now as I meet people as I travel, I have this wall that I put up between me and them. I refuse to connect on a deep level just because I know where it's going to go. I know that if we connect on a deep level, if our friendship becomes deeper, it's going to be harder and harder just to say goodbye. Nice to meet you, but goodbye. I will never see you again. So that has been such a frustrating part about traveling that I now have this wall and I prevent, I mean, I can make a lot of friends and we can be friends, but we won't be deep friends. I refuse to let it happen. Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, but that's what I choose to do because it, it's not fun. Imagine right now you connect with someone who is amazing in your country and then you just have to say goodbye to them forever. It's not a fun thing. It is not a fun thing to do. Imagine doing that every week. Yeah, It takes a toll on your heartstrings. <laughs> so ah, I've had to develop this crazy wall. Um, you, are, you are without a doubt one of the most underrated YouTube content providers ever. Well, thank you. Yeah, nobody, nobody watches my content because YouTube kills me. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, when you travel, how far in advance do you plan? When you travel, when you travel, how far in advance do you plan regarding places where you stay, etc.? Um, so I have planned as far in advance as five or six months. Yeah, when I went to Africa. That was like a five or six month advance planning thing. Um, 
And I would say on the other end of the spectrum, I would say plan in advance is maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes in advance, <laughs> really. Um, I mean, just in India, for example, long story, but so many hotels refuse to take foreigners, refuse because I don't know, or whatever, there's so many, whatever, so stupid, but they refuse. And so I don't, I don't book in advance anymore because so many times I've booked in advance, get to the hotel, spend time getting there. And then the hotel say, oh no, we don't take foreigners, sorry. And then you're like, what? So you either get the money back after many days or you don't get the money back at all. Um, or you have to spend an hour on the phone to argue to get this money back. It's terrible. So I've learned just to take a train, go to my place, and then walk around and find a hotel, which takes hours sometimes. And I'm not kidding, hours. So um, plan in advance, I don't. I just walk and look for places to stay. That's how, that's my traveling in advance. So none, I don't tra travel, in, I don't plan in advance for hospitality or homes. So, but as a general rule of thumb, like if I'm going to go from this country, when I go to Sri Lanka, I will try to plan uh, two weeks to one month in advance. Generally three weeks, I guess. Um, a month is kind of far, two weeks is a little bit short. So three-ish three -ish weeks, I think does the job. Um, yeah. Um, where? Let's see, what do we got? Have you ever been, have you ever been to Papua New Guinea? Ah! That is a place that is on my list that I want to go along with Indonesia. So if I go to Indonesia, I would go to New Guinea. What's interesting about Papua New Guinea is every flight I have ever seen to go from any major city to Papua New Guinea, I think Papua New Guinea is such a um, financially desperate country. Just looking at it, maybe I'm wrong. I haven't seen the numbers, but just looking at, it's a lot of it. A lot of underdevelopment in that location. So I think one of the ways that the government can get as much money as possible is to overcharge the flights, the flights, the price of the place, the price of the flights. Um, and so they just add a massive tax to any plane that lands, period. And so the government can rake in money for free, basically. So I have seen plane tickets, uh, like for example, my back. I have to like bend down and my back is broken. The last couple of days my back has hurt so bad. And so now I'm bending down to talk to you and it's just like killing me. Um, let's say here is me in India, here is Papua New Guinea. It's a very far distance, um, but it doesn't matter where I come from. If I come from here to here, it's like $3,000 for a cheap ticket. That's not first class, that's just like cheap and there's no cheaper tickets. So. But, but so if I want to go from here to here, it's like $3,000. But if I want to go from here to here, a different country, it's like $600. <laughs> so to land in this country is ridiculous. Now they're probably, I'm guessing you can find cheaper flights somewhere. If I did my homework, I probably could. But generally the flights to go there are super expensive. So that is one of the reasons why I have not gone there. Um, if I go there, I will go from, I will, when I travel Indonesia, I will travel to New Guinea. Um, that's my guess. But the whole Indonesia thing is again, a difficult visa place. I can get a free visa for a month, but anything beyond that is difficult. I looked into it to get a six month visa and it's just mountains of paperwork and you have to prove where you're going to go and where you're going to stay and how long you're going to be there. It's just a nightmare to travel there for six months. But there are people who do it, so I'm sure it's possible, but that's one of the reasons why I haven't went to Indonesia. The visa process looks just Insane. Um, are you, without a doubt, oh, uh, have you ever traveled to the same country twice except America? Yes. Um, well, I was on a cruise ship. Some of you know I was on a cruise ship for a long time. So I went to the same place many, many times. So I went like around the United Kingdom eight times and stopped in France eight times and, and, and Ireland eight times and the United Kingdom eight times. Uh, Scotland eight times, Norway like a couple times maybe, I don't know, um, there's more, I don't know, yeah, so yes, but if I exclude that, just regards to solo traveling, 
Um, yeah, I went to the Philippines for two weeks. Then I flew to Thailand. Then I went back to the Philippines for like another month, something like that. Um, and then, yeah, other than visa runs, visa runs don't count. Like I was in Vietnam, went to Cambodia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Vietnam, Cambodia, back. But I never traveled in Cambodia during those visa runs. But technically, I went to a country and then went back. So technically, yes, but no. Um, but I did live in Vietnam for like a year, went to travel in Cambodia for one month, and then came back to Vietnam to live for another four months, something like that. So yeah, twice, kind of. Um, are you ever scared there? No. Um, I think I wrote a post about this too. Um, I don't know. No. Uh, yes, I, and there are times. There are times where I get nervous. I can say Cambodia. I was nervous a couple times, but not because of people, but because of animals, dogs. Like I literally thought that I was going to be killed at that moment by dogs. Never, I mean, it wasn't just a simple dog territorial thing, barking, barking, make you go away. No, 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 no. It was hair on the back of their bodies standing up, like their fangs were out. Like you see pictures of wolves growling and like, like that, like they were chasing me. And had there not been a small river to jump over, I honestly believe that they would have ripped my legs apart. Um, it was insane. That happened twice in Cambodia. So yeah, there are times where you do get nervous. Um, but generally, due to people, no, I can't think of any. Um, what what sources do you use to what sources do you use to prepare for a new country? I don't. Um, the very first thing that I do, let's say I'm going to go to Papua New Guinea, the first thing that I will do is type in Papua New Guinea scams. Okay. Uh, I do have a resource. If you go to solotravel365.com uh, and then under the keywords, just type in, um, I don't know, just type in scam and you will see the article. There's probably two articles that, that, that have this question. How do you prepare for traveling to a new country or something like that? Um, and I just type in scams. I want to know how people scam you because in every single country, the scams are different. You think that, you may think that, the scams are different and are the same. Like, ah, don't worry, I don't need to prepare. I know what scams, what to look for. Uh-uh. I can tell you that every country has scams that you would never, never believe that is possible. They will go so far out of the way to scam you, and you will have no idea that you're getting scammed until it's too late or it's right down to the last second. And you're like, oh, this whole thing was a scam. It's insane. So do your homework. That is the one thing that I do before visiting every country. Other than that, uh -uh. I will generally look for like country, Papua New Guinea, dangerous areas. So stay away from here. It's like a conflict zone. Stay away from here. It's a military zone. Okay, done. That's it. Everything else I learn as I go. I don't want to have preconceptions. Is that, did I use that right? Uh, I don't want to label the country before I get there. So I kind of know what to expect. Uh -uh. I go into a country, I have no idea what's going to happen, no idea. I don't even research the tourist areas, I don't, nothing. I want to enter a country and all I know is the name. That's what I did with India, that's what I did with Vietnam, that's what I did with the Philippines, that's what I did with Cambodia, Thailand, same thing. I just go and whatever happens, happens. Uh, in fact, when I went to Bangladesh, same thing, Bangladesh. Um, I get so much grief from Bangladeshis watching some of my videos and they'll say something like, uh, just a couple days ago, yeah, just a couple days ago, I posted this on uh, Instagram, um, but this has happened so many times in so many countries. People say, oh, you went to these terrible areas. Why did you go here and not go to the business section that is beautiful and wealthy? Like, well, it's stupid. Um, but when I went to Bangladesh, I did not visit one location, not one location that I chose. I let every single person choose my location for me. All of the local people who sent me a message from different areas, people said, hey, come here. Hey, visit me here. Hey, go here. Hey, visit me here. Okay. I made my whole journey about visiting the people who invited me to their area. I did not choose one single area. Yeah. So it was, this is what I do. Same thing. Well, India is a little bit different. Um, when I traveled in North India, that the whole thing was um, 
general, I would say 95% of my entire journey was generated by local people. It was not even my choice. The only place I think I chose was like Varanasi. Yeah. Everything other than that, mm -mm. local people invited me. I said, okay. And I went. That's it. So that's generally what I would do in every single country. So um, to answer your question, I don't prepare. I don't want to prepare. To me, that just tells me what I'm supposed to expect, and I don't want that. I want to go into a clean slate. And so often I catch grief because when I talk in the way that I do on YouTube and say, oh, wow, look at this, or this is new, or I didn't know this, people think I'm stupid because how did you not know this before going there? Well, I don't research. I don't, I don't know a thing. I just want to go and share what happens, share the moment, not these preconceived ideas about what I think you should think. Yeah, I don't want that. I just want to share what happens. Um, hopefully that answers your question. It's kind of a big answer. Do, 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 do. Um, do you ever get lonely? Ah, I answered that question as well. Um, a couple people asked that. How much do you spend approximately per month? Leave out the air travel. Um, ooh, that's a difficult question to answer also because every country is totally different. There's been countries where I have visited over the years, and I have spent, oh man, more than 2,000 US dollars in a month. And there's been countries where I have spent, in one month, $250. I'm not joking, that includes everything. Transportation, food, hotels, yeah. So, there's a blend in the middle. It all depends on hospitality of the local people. Some people, I'd say the biggest factor is when people say, hey, no, 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 don't stay at a hotel, come to my house, no problem. And India was a big contributor to that. Bangladesh was as well. I would say those have been the two most hospitable countries I've ever been to. And so that helped dramatically. Either A, spend $15 to stay at a hotel per night, $15 average, so give me a second. Uh, let me find this calculator. So 15 times 30, $450 per month just to sleep, not to eat, not to go anywhere. That's to sleep and look out a window, nothing else. And that's staying at a cheap hotel, $450 a month. So that adds up dramatically every month, dropping $450, $450 per month, per month. That's the same. So, yeah, cutting corners helps a lot. And so when people are kind enough to say, hey, come to my house, I'm very thankful because, yes, you saved me $15. Into that, and that may not sound like a lot of money, but I don't look at it from a daily standpoint. I look at it as a, as a monthly standpoint, a yearly standpoint. So if I'm dropping 450, uh, 450 times 12, if I stay in a hotel every night, cheap hotel every night, um, oops, 400, 450 times 12, I'm spending $5,400 per year. That's just on sleeping. No food, no transportation, no flights, uh, no tourism, nothing. Zero. That's sleeping. So I'm very thankful when people invite me to their house. I do not ask. I've never asked a single person in my travel, hey, can I stay at your house? Never once, not once. These are all kind people who invited me to their house. So the lower, yeah, $250, that's insane, right? Um, I was shocked. Um, but this is, when, this is what happens when people are kind and hospitable. They just say, no, 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 come to my house. And then obviously when you're at their house, they're super happy that you're there. Um, and they provide food as well. And I feel guilty, I do, because I'm like, oh, you're going so far out of the way, but they somehow don't see it like that. They often see this as a sign of, it's almost as if they receive more benefit than I do. Like they receive some type of internal gratification that is far higher than what I'm experiencing. I don't know, it's a really weird thing from a Western perspective. It's more of an Asian thing, I don't know, um, but I'm very appreciative of this. Yeah, 250, that's happened once. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, I promise. Um, but it does happen. Um, do, 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 do. But average, oh, I would say, fig if you figure on 
$800, or $800 per month, you can live very comfortably, you can travel very comfortably in Asia. $800 per month, that's what I would say. There's a couple countries with the exception, but that's about average. Um, okay, I think I'm on the, yeah, last page. Um, the money, how to earn while traveling, sponsors, how to get them. Um, so money, I talked about that earlier. I don't really earn money very much. Um, sponsors, how to get sponsors. Well, I don't get sponsors, really. I have kind of one. Um, which is uh, a VPN service. But generally, so since I've been on YouTube for four years, I would say after about two years, I started to receive sponsorships or offers or whatever. And to this day, well, be before the whole pandemic thing happened, before that, when my traffic was really high, I was averaging about one sponsor offer per week week and a half about that, something like that. Anywhere, on average, between one and two weeks, I would receive an email from a new company saying, hey, we want to sponsor you. Hey, we want to give you money to talk about us. Hey, we want to send you a product. And I have declined 100% of them, 100, besides the VPN who reached out to me. So it just wasn't a good fit. Some, some will be like, hey, wear our sunglasses and sell them to your audience. No, sorry. Or, hey, like this, some of the stupidest things, some would fit. I was actually reached out to by a massive company in Vietnam who wanted me to develop a, Viet, uh, a YouTube series to show people how they can get a visa, like push people to use their visa service. Sorry, I mean, it's a cool thing, but no. I'm not really interested in that. Um, sorry. So money is not everything to me <laughs> at all. No thanks. So I've been reached out to a ton of people. So how do you get these people? Two options. Either option A, build a giant audience. They will naturally find you. You don't have to do anything. They will reach out to you. Option B, um, reach out to them. <laughs> yeah. There are websites that kind of bring the two together also. Um, I can't think of the names, but just go to Google, like for example, type in uh, like YouTube creator sponsorships, enter on Google, and you will see that there are a couple major websites that connect creators with businesses together to do a partnership. Some of these things can be a couple hundred dollars, some can be a couple thousand dollars. I have chosen to not do them, I've, I've browsed through them, and there's really nothing that jumps out at me at all. Um, and then plus, right now, with my channel being dead, um, I just chose to ignore this for a while. It, wouldn't be a, it would not be a benefit for them at this point because the traffic that I'm receiving, YouTube is still, they have a blanket over my channel because of this whole China thing. It's insane. So I don't know what to do. I think my channel is dead for it will be either for a long time or maybe permanent. I have no idea. There's only a few people who, every time I make a video, I can see the statistics, and YouTube just does not give the notification to people that I have a new video. So it's just, it's just really disheartening. YouTube is becoming a platform that is just censored, 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 and blah. Um, what else? They get like, uh, how best can we take care of our health during solo travel? Uh, can okay. Um, personally, I I try to eat as healthy as possible. It became difficult when I was traveling and people invited me into their houses quite frequently. Um, Sometimes it wasn't the healthiest food, and you think, ah, well, it's only one time. Yeah, you're right, but multiply that by every day. Um, it becomes like a, you're eating kind of bad food every day. I wouldn't say bad. It's just a lot of bread. I, a lot of the food in some of the places that I went was like 
mountain of bread and then a little bit of other stuff. And so that's just not super healthy. So generally, um, I generally in Asia, it's very easy to find fruit stands. So like every day, every other day, I go to the fruit stand and I buy fresh fruit and I eat fresh fruit. So you can buy bananas, you can buy oranges, you, all of the fruit is there. You can buy it and eat as much as you can. Um, so fresh fruit is my candy, I guess. That's what I try to eat as much as possible. <clears throat> Have you ever visited Chittagong Hill Tracks in Bangladesh? Uh, I was in Chittagong, but not there. It's a very beautiful place with a mixture of more than 40 ethnic groups. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah, I really want to go back to Bangladesh. Honestly, I do. Um, I will. I just don't know when. Um, now that I have a drone, I want to. I want to get so much drone footage. But it's illegal to fly a drone in Bangladesh, and I really don't want to get caught by the authorities. But some of the local people I talked to about flying a drone there, they said, "Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. Just don't worry about the police. It's not even a big deal here. People drive, fly drones all the time. Just don't fly in the city. Fly in the countryside. You'll be fine." So I think that's good, but I don't know. I, uh, it's coming from my country, the law is the law, and you don't challenge the law. <laughs> so I'm nervous, uh, but I don't know. So I want to fly a drone, and I would love to get endless footage in your country because it's so beautiful. So I definitely don't feel any different drinking this. Um, How do you learn a language? What routine do you use? Oh my God, good question. <clears throat> I'll save that, hold on. Don't go anywhere. Um, congrats on 30K, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, do you remember any unusual food that you've eaten during your travels? Yeah, so, yeah. All the food is unusual, it's so weird to me. All of it, all of it. I remember, I, I, I can tell you some unfortunate food things, moments. Um, go, after you're done watching this, go to my YouTube channel and type in Vietnamese street food foreigner, Vietnamese street food foreigner, and you'll watch, you'll see my video pop up. It's like a 15 minute video. It's me, another foreigner, and a local man who brings all of this street food to us and we just taste test everything. It's a funny video. Oh, I love this video. We were laughing so hard. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see some of the weird stuff that we eat, like what the hell? It's so strange. So, but other than that, like just here, here in this place, I went to get soup and I start eating the soup, eating the soup, getting to the bottom. And at the bottom, there's a big maggot, huge, like a, like a grub, a big worm. Like, oh great, that's just wonderful, I'm eating worms. Um, how many did I chew and swallow and not know it? I have no idea. Other times, I remember in Vietnam, some of the strangest things that I found were uh, pieces of plastic, like literally plastic shavings inside noodles. Noodles, so you have the noodle that's cooked and built inside it was plastic. Plastic pieces, plastic shavings, plastic everywhere, like all over. Oh, that's that was here too. Here in India, I found the same thing, but it wasn't plastic. It was like, uh, maybe it was, I don't know what it was, but it sure wasn't food. It was some material, like like part of their machines ground bits of plastic, and then it went, went into the food, and then when you cook the food and look at it, pieces are inside the food. It's so it was factory problems. Other times, People are cooking street food and they use like a metal spatula. I don't know if you know spatula. Um, the, 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 some of you speak perfect English, some of you don't. So I'm trying to do this. In the, so a spatula is the thing that you flip the food as you're cooking, this thing. So they would scrape the, the metal cooking pan um, and they push too hard. And so the metal in the metal digs metal out and so metal shavings come out of the pan and go into your food and you don't know it. You start eating and ah, all of a sudden you get this sharp pain that goes inside your skin and you have to pull out this metal, this like piece of metal inside your body. And you're like, oh my God, this is a metal. I'm eating metal. So some of the weirdest stuff you'll come in contact with is just the sanitation rules in Asia are just nothing compared to the West. 
just, I mean, it's just like it doesn't exist. So you have to be particularly careful. So what is your X? I don't know X. What's your X? What's your daily routine? Oh my God. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, do you look, oh, that's a weird question. No, thanks. Um, what, a toilet paper question? No. Um, what is the worst part about being a solo traveler? I think someone asked, asked that already. Solotravel365.com slash pros cons. Um, last question on my phone. When you travel, how far in advance do you plan regarding, oh, I answered that one already. So someone, someone asked that already. How far in advance do you plan? Um, ah, because I copied a piece of each. Okay, yeah, that's it, I think. Yes, cool, done. Um, do you remember any unusual foods? What's your daily routine? Oh my God. Um, I wake up every day, go out, get breakfast, come back, eat it, do the dishes, start working. And when I say working, right now, my primary focus is not even on YouTube. It's to grow my current website, um, solotravel365.com. And I hope in the future, um, this time, I got the hiccups. This time next year, um, it will be larger um, and I will attract Google's attention and I will have a stream of traffic that I can monetize. That's basically, uh, it's going to be an income source. That's the whole point of this. So, yeah. So that's pretty much what I'm focused on right now is building, building, building while I am stuck in India in this room instead of looking out the window or instead of watching YouTube every day and just relaxing and enjoying the time off, uh -uh. I am working a lot. So I usually, after breakfast is finished, I start working at about 10 o'clock, so which is about this time in the morning. It's 10, 19 a.m. for me right now on Sunday. Um, so from 10 o'clock all the way until 10 or 11 o'clock p.m. So that's with a couple breaks in the middle because I go out for lunch um, and sometimes I just need to stand up and walk outside for a moment or I go to the grocery store or whatever. So I would say I'm averaging about nine or 10 hours of work every day, just nonstop for months and months and months I've been doing that. So uh, I'm very happy in a sense that I'm stuck here because I have been able to get so much done, like accomplish so much. I'm still not finished. There's still more that I need to do um, before I leave, but um, yeah, had this pandemic thing not happen, I would still be so far behind. Like, I don't even, it's just crazy. So I think I have learned, side note, I think I have learned that I need to travel less. Ah, I know, right? Um, I need to take more time to focus on me and get caught up and less time recording and traveling. Maybe I need to, after four years, maybe I need to find a perfect balance because I haven't found it I think I have gotten closer to understanding this and finding this balance, but it's been a learning curve for me for four years, so I need to slow down a little bit. Um, you deserve 100 subs, very entertaining and good info. Well, thank you. Uh, what is, what, what, what is three things you considered you must visit in a country often? Um, marketing is important, you've got, Great content, well, thank you. How easy to get a visa right now? How easy to get a visa where? Because visas are dependent upon what country I am from and what country I want to go to and, drum roll, what country I am in when I am trying to get the visa for that other country. So, for example, if you want to go to Pakistan and you're from one country, super easy. Pay a little money, go, very easy. Put your name, you're in. Um, but if you're an American, in the United States and want to go to Pakistan. It's apparently easier now. Last year they changed some things. I still haven't tried yet, but it's easier, but it's still a thing you have to fill out and do all of this stuff. Um, but if you're an American wanting to go to Pakistan, but you're in India when you want to do this, oh my God, that's when things change. I need to go to the US, I need to go to the Pakistani embassy, fill out all this paperwork, get a lot of paperwork, take that paperwork, pay money in the own U.S. Embassy. I have to pay $50 just to talk to my own U.S. Embassy. 
Um, and then they give, they fill out more paperwork, give me that paperwork. Then I have to go back to the Pakistani embassy. They have to fill out more paperwork and approve or decline everything. And then I can gain access to the country. It's insane. So it depends on a few factors. So I don't know. Um, what three things do you consider you must, what, I don't even understand your question. What are, maybe what are three things you consider you must visit in a country? It's just people. For me, it's people. I don't care about mountains. I don't care about buildings. I don't care about the beaches. I just want to meet people. So that is my only concern. Not a concern, but that's my only desires. Meet more people, learn more about their culture. The more interaction that I have with people who can speak English or not, because again, I can translate with my phone, um, the more I will learn about the people and their culture. So it's just about interactions. Um, Yeah, how do you learn a language, the routine that you use? I know, I, I was going to come back to that. <laughs> uh, cool, I thought I'm making a blog too about health and fitness and music. Good work, man, yeah, good. Um, I will say, um, like health, like lose weight, one of the most difficult blogs to enter today. Like that is one of the most difficult, period. But yeah, fitness, uh, my recommendation to you is be extremely specific. Like. If you're going to make a blog about health, fitness, and music together, don't even start. Like, it's going to be a waste of your time. If you're going to make a blog about health, be super specific. How? Like, specifically how about what about health? Or about fitness. What type of fitness? Are you talking about yoga? Are you talking about, like, karate? Are you talking about jogging? Like, you need to have a specific type of fitness and then focus your whole blog about that. That is how you're going to dominate. Same thing with music. Music, oh my God. Like if you're gonna say all genres, you might as well not even start the blog to begin with. You need to get super specific. What type of music? Like are you talking about types or are you talking about making music? Or are you talking about listening to music? Like what are the best headphones to use to listen and why? Like you could, you could start a whole blog just about how to listen to music. I don't think a lot of people are searching for that, so don't. But my recommendation is just be ultra, ultra, ultra specific. So for me, it's solo travel, not just traveling the world, not just traveling, not flying on planes. Not, it's not about that. Like you can think of traveling is so broad. Oh my God, there's hotels, there's planes, there's food, there's transportation, there's visas, there's, uh, -uh. it's solo travel, like traveling alone. So I have very, I'm targeting a very niche audience. And so it's going to be everything about that. I'm starting talking about flights, then I'm talking about insurance, then I'll be talking about hospitality, and I'm going to be talking about um, other things that I'm forgetting right now, uh, cruises. So these are all things over the next four years that I'm going to be blogging about to grow. So you need to get super specific. So that's my recommendation to you because you'll probably fail if you don't get super specific. Um, you just won't rank very well. So therefore you will fail. So get super, super targeted, super, super specific, and Google will love you, and then your blog will dominate, surpassing everyone else on that particular topic. Um, what's your plan about the future after 40? Travel, I want to travel till I die. Uh, is there a link to your new webpage? Solo, there's not. It's just solotravel365.com, that's it. Um, should I make a blog only based on music done with a guitar? Okay, cool, what do you think? Do it. If you believe that you have a lot of information about this, like um, music done with a guitar, okay, but you have to be more specific. Like what about music? Making music with a guitar, guitar how, to, how to create music with a guitar, how to play the guitar, I wouldn't do that because a lot of people I mean, I think that niche is saturated right now. How to play, how to learn, um, but how to, how to, what was your question? Um, how, how to create new riffs, how to create new music from nothing. Like how do I come up with a good tune or guitar, guitar and this style of music, guitar and that style of music. I don't know, just all I can say is try to get as specific as possible. Start creating 30, 40, 50 posts about that. That's going to take you months and months. After you have done that, then you can branch out to slightly bigger topics, slightly bigger topics, and then grow that way. So that's my recommendation. 
Uh, does any of your products get stolen? Yeah, uh, in the Philippines, someone pickpocketed my phone. In India, someone, after I took him out to lunch at a four-star restaurant, and after he helped me for several hours, when I'm talking to someone, he went in my bag and stole 100 US dollars. Not joking, because I went in my bag, I paid, all of my money was there, I paid the, the, the waiter, um, put it back, did something over here, when I looked back, all of the money was gone, and the only man who was there was this man. I was in a corner booth. I mean, the wall did not reach out and take money from my bag. He was the only person there, but obviously he, long story, but two times. So I would say that's really, really good. After meeting close to 5,000 different people in the last four years, and I say that number with quite confidence, I've met a ton of people, um, just a ton of people. It's just insane. So. That's pretty good numbers. So um, anyway, that's pretty much it. And I've been babbling for an hour and a half. I'm probably going to go. So basically, if you want to learn more about what I've been doing, it is the website solotravel365.com. Um, it's just all about solo traveling. If you're interested in becoming a solo travel, this will solo traveler, this will be your resource. There's going to be so much information there. There already is a ton of information there that you can learn that you did not know before. You will read for hours and hours if you start now. Um, and by the time you finish, you will be so much more educated and well prepared, much more than I ever was. Um, so basically, every day, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm focused on that, and as you can see, I'm not really focused on YouTube right now, mainly because my channel is dead, because of YouTube themselves, the algorithms, um, and um, I don't know, I, I'm not traveling, so there's not really much to say. So that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. Hopefully the flights will open up in about a month, less than a month, and then I'll go to Sri Lanka, but no guarantees. Um, who knows, maybe I will stay here and get married. Uh, get married to an Indian girl from Tamil Nadu, and maybe I, maybe I should start learning Tamil Nadu. Last question, which was about the language. I don't know. Um, I guess the, 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 the first things that I learn, um, I go on the internet and I learn, um, I just go to Google and type in, how do I say this in this language? And it's, I always start with who, what, where, how, why, which, when. Those are the most important words in any language because if I just say that, people can understand me. If they come up to me and say blah, 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 I, I don't know, and I, and I don't understand them, or, or I can usually, usually use communicate with body language in the beginning. Um, but I can, I, can, I can say, let's say, if I, if I said the name of train station, train station, okay, or train, train, they understand train, but train what? How much does a train cost? How much does a train cost to go from here to where? Um, like, what am I saying? But if I know who, what, where, how, why, which, when, then I can say train, where? Ah, then they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah over here. Train, um, or how much, or how far, yeah? If I say that, train, how far, yeah? Like, how many minutes? Um, so train, where? Um, who, what, where, how, why, which, when, yeah. Just those are the basics. I start from there and I have to memorize, memorize, memorize. And so that's kind of be difficult in the first couple of days. Um, but then that's it. Then I just branch out from there. Then I learn nouns, lots of nouns and verbs, nouns and verbs, nouns and verbs. I don't care about grammar in the beginning. Um, because if I said, if I said, my name is Brock, but let's say I don't, let's say I don't know how to say is, so my name Brock, um, you understand me, my grammar's bad, but what if I said Brock, my name, or Brock name my, Brock name my, grammar is totally wrong, but you still understand me, yeah? So it's the same thing in virtually every language. As long as you say the key words, the nouns, the adjectives, like running, run, yeah, jump, the adjectives, um, I'm sorry, the verbs, the verbs, <laughs> nouns and verbs. Um, if as long as you say them, people will generally understand. Some languages are a little bit different, but they'll understand you. So memorize who, what, where, how, why, which, when, and memorize a few nouns and a few verbs. And then it kind of starts from there. And eventually you'll learn enough where 
you will start to understand the grammar. You'll listen, you will listen to people and say, oh yeah, 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 I, I understood the words that you said, but now you arrange the words in this way. So now I start to understand the grammar. So I need to, I need to arrange my sentence. Like Hindi, the, the language that I know more than anything else right now, has the weirdest grammar, like the weirdest grammar ever in my mind. It's just everything is backwards. <sighs> Everything is just backwards, and within each section that is backwards, those things are backwards as well. It's just like, rah, everything. So I have to really speak slow and think about it. So, but anyway, nouns, verbs, who, what, where, how, why, which, when. Memorize those in the beginning, and you'll be able to communicate to so many people so quickly, and even understand kind of what they're talking about when they speak to you. So that's the core. But generally, you can just go on YouTube and type in uh, common phrases in this language and then just memorize. It's a memorization game. game. Say it 20 times. Um, um, uh, give me a second. Like, maybe what do you want? I'm guessing. I have no idea. So in Vietnamese, I could say something like Ban uh, Moon. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but what I said was, you want what? So what do you want? Something like that. Uh, meaning, or which would be something like, where is your house? So did I say it wrong? Probably, but anyone could probably understand me. Um, Something like this. So just memorize those key words and then it will build from there. Uh, Mary of Bengali, let me help you find a bride. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's funny, every country that I go to, people ask me, are you going to marry a Filipina girl? Are you going to marry a Bangladeshi? Are you going to marry, in every area in India, they will say the name of their state. Uh, a girl from Tamil Nadu, are you going to marry a girl from um, Calcutta or, 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 or um, Rajasthan or, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Everyone will say the same thing. Cambodia. Um, no. <sighs> I love traveling alone. I think it's better than traveling with a wife. But who knows? Maybe I will find a wife who really likes to travel and understands everything that... I don't know. It's, I think I'm in a weird situation. It's going to be difficult to find someone who really fits well with me. I have to... My, all of that... I'm using all of my internet data today, so I have to go very soon before it's all gone. Um, did you really get a piece of metal stuck in your mouth eating street food? Yes, absolutely. I had to yank it out and it really, really hurt. Uh, that was in Vietnam. Um, thank you for your time. Good live show. Yes. Well, thank you all for coming, I guess. Um, that was fun. I try to do this every, well, I try every two weeks, but Recently, it's been every month. Um, but when I'm traveling, I think every two weeks, I try to have one of these, uh, just because they're fun. I enjoy answering questions, and it's fun. Um, such a good talker. I'm having fun on your live and interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. That's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to go and start finishing a post that I started yesterday. I have many more hours to go. Um, thank you all for watching. Remember. Your time is running out. Start living, start traveling. Take care. I don't know how to end this thing. <laughs> Bye.